welcome to the hard sell, where the stick in the small bucket rattles back. And this episode was a request from Alexander Falaski. If you want to make your own requests, feel free to contact me via boblefish.org.uk, or better yet, sign up to my Patreon, because I'm more likely to listen if you give me money. Deal with it. So today's request makes for an international... Have a break. The reason behind this was the recent death of Jamie Kellner, a highly respected television executive in the US and trusted longtime henchman of both Rupert Murdoch and Ted Turner. Kellner had his fingerprints on the launch of both those big men's all new TV networks, Fox in 1987 and the WB in 1995. In tribute, Alexander Falaski requested I take a look at one of those networks' launch days. I chose the WB for a few reasons. Kellner was more closely associated with the Turner Empire, having ultimately took over the running of TBS from Ted Turner himself. Also, YouTube searching for Fox Network material kept giving me Fox News, and fuck that noise, and the WB is just more interesting in general, if only because it's the underdog, or underfrog. While the Fox Networks that exists, the WB only lasted a pinch over a decade as itself, and is largely forgotten about now, except as one of the two slightly backwards yokels, UPN being the other, that gave birth to the mutant child, the CW. The WB launched on the 1st of November 1995 with a skit featuring the sainted Chuck Jones, because everyone expected the network to have some kind of Looney Tunes-related aesthetic. In the event, they decided to mix it up a bit. Gee, Daffy, I wonder who they're going to get to pull the switch. Why me, indubitably, as I possess all of the talent around here. Frog. And so Michigan J. Frog became the face and voice of the WB for its first several years. Yeah, proud to present on the WB, another bad show that no one will see. I need a drink. The Fox Network there, calling the kettle black. They were saved by the Simpsons, just as the WB was saved by Buffy. And then Disney ate the lot. Disney owns you. Anyway, after that, the network starts properly with the Wines Bros, which I'm not going to go into, except to say it's probably quite a decent market for where race relations in the USA were at in 1995. We're brothers, we're happy and we're singing and we're colored. Give me a high five. All right, cut and print. Beautiful guys. Dynamite, that is... Later in the title sequence, they get an old lady run over. I don't know. It's better than white chicks. The Wines Bros was brought to you by Saturn Motors, as Michigan reminds you, in lieu of what in the UK would be a brake bumper. While you're watching this show and howling at the jokes, remember it's been brought to you by those Saturn folks. Yeah, much as I love one froggy evening, I can see how this would get old fairly quickly. Easy enough to redub and reuse, though, at least for comedies. And as long as the sponsor is always a two syllable word. We'll meet Saturn again in more detail later, though. So, on to the adverts, starting with. Drugs. No good drugs. Cold and flu drugs. It is November after all. The National Ski Patrol just approved Sudafed cold and cough for patrollers on duty. Sudafed. That's not the one with the skull, that's Sinutab, but it's still basically the same thing from a different company. And they just got a big time celebrity endorsement. I mean corporate endorsement. And a not particularly big time. I mean I don't suppose the National Ski Patrol could have stopped their employees if they wanted to take sign you tab instead, but that's not what he means. He means that Sudafed is now the Ski Patrol's brand of choice to carry in their backpacks. Well, at the very least, he's been certified as perfectly adequate to go in first aid kits. Approved because Sudafed cold and cough relieves coughs, congestion and aches with no drowsy side effects. Sorry about the visual jumping about, it's an old tape. In more technical language, what Don LaFontaine just said was that it's made of pseudoephedrine, 
hence the name, and paracetamol, rather than anything antihistamine adjacent that might make you dopey, which to be sure is something you don't need if you're sliding down a mountain in a snowstorm with two planks tied to your feet. Because he has recently come out that these decongestions might actually not do a damn thing after all, and pseudoephedrine in particular may actually cause brain damage, but probably doesn't unless you eat them like Tic Tacs. But they didn't know that 30 years ago, or nearly 30 years ago, which I'm sorry to tell you is how long ago this was. I'm sorry. Sudafed cold and cough clears you up without slowing you down. Because we don't all have the same face. Anomalisa, a film by Charlie Kaufman. There's the Schick Tracer. Tracer flexes to fit each individual face, leaving your unique face uniquely comfortable. Well, it's more interesting than Tommy Vance bellowing about blades. It might have had more instant impact if the generic face at the beginning were truly generic, rather than just some random guy. If everyone had essentially been Jason Fleming in Bruiser, is what I mean, we'd have got the message quicker. There's also something troubling about them all being white guys, especially when one of them turns black. Being your unique face, uniquely comfortable. The Schick Tracer, we're changing the face of shaving. Note the bored, near-monotone voiceover. Sort of ad man's approximation of Stephen Wright that only gets about a quarter of the way there. That is very mid-90s. Like the voiceover's too cool to give a shit about selling something, do you? It never actually worked. It was annoying in general use, but particularly doomed in advertising because there was and is no getting around the fact that they are trying to sell you something, and pretending not to care was just patronising at best and insulting at worst. Anyway, Schick don't make a big thing of it here, so they just about get away with it. What a great day to buy a car. I thought the days of women being treated differently than men were long gone. From men. And I would have corrected you if you'd been a man, or MB, or an animated frog. It's not different than, it's different from. This is the vanity mirror, so you can check your makeup. Then I tried to buy a car. Something reliable. It's safe. Sporty. How much you looking to spend? I want to spend about $12,000. Rich can help you out. I'll be back to you soon, okay? This is that promised Saturn advert. Because as the sponsors of this programming block, they get to have their adverts in the middle of each break, as well as having Michigan singing their names at the start. Saturn was a subsidiary of General Motors, whose main gimmick was their relative independence from GM a whole new dealer network with its own rules. Specifically, no haggling, no price schmoozing, every car goes for the price on the windscreen. That way, in theory, the salesmen are less obnoxious and more focused on the car itself. That's a theory anyway. And that was how they sold the brand, not as a nice car to drive, but simply as a nice car to buy. So nice it might even inspire you to change careers. When I got to Saturn, Dave Pierce took the time to answer all my questions. Not only did I buy a Saturn, I thought it might be fun to sell them. Could you just casually decide that in 1995? I mean, I know we still had an economy back then. Was that one of the perks? Just being able to drop everything and become a car salesperson on a whim? You know what I like best about working here? Showing guys the vanity mirror. Props for the faint feminist seasoning as well. Might be half assed and frankly tokenistic, but it's better than nothing. And now, a ballet for French fries and classic TV themes. A three hour tour. 58 channels and nothing on. Well, nothing but repeats anyway. Hardly seems worth the trouble of seducing the remote control away with the promise of thrice. And then McDonald's fries, and they're probably pretty gross themselves anyway. All that preservative. Hey, you could do worse than Bewitched. Doesn't seem to be anything original on. She could have switched it back to Gilligan's Island. I want $50,000 tomorrow. And a movie trailer for a Disney film. Eat a dick, Warner Bros. Well, right, Hollywood Pictures, but Hollywood Pictures was one of the mousy's disguises at the time. 
And here it is. Kevin Franklin decided he needed a change. Derek. That's right. Now he's pretending he's Derek Bond. Dr. Bond? And as long as nobody finds out. Nurse, where's that Novocaine? No, no. Not that. What? Kevin's having the time Go. of Derek's life. Sinbad. Phil Hartman. House guest. What do you think? You're a lucky man. Does that mean you can do something for him? Whoa! Rated PG. Oh. Now playing at a theater near you. Yes, that was it. You may need to watch it again in order to actually figure out what the movie's about, or what happens in it, and why. But I'm not going to facilitate that for you, because I'm not going to be an accessory to my viewers wasting their mental energy that way. House guest from director Randall Miller, who brought you... Nothing. I suppose Bottle Shop was watchable enough. This is the result of Disney discovering this visually striking six foot five black comedian, signing him up for a sitcom and a movie, watching the sitcom sink without trace, and then realizing it was a pay or play contract. So now they had to make Sinbad happen. In House Guest, and you might be forgiven for thinking it was the trailer's job to make you aware of this, but let's face it, it didn't. Sinbad plays this lovable loser guy who finagles his way into the house of the late Philip Hartman, who is a dentist. Somehow, the entire population of the world gets the impression that Sinbad is in fact the Hartman character, and so he goes along with it, presumably for the sake of the movie. Hence the hilarious diastema-related humour towards the end there. He got largely nonplussed reviews and made a modest box office profit. And so he moved on to his defining role. Do not at me. That's the last advert, but before we return to the Wines Bros, there's also a trailer for another of the WB's launch sitcoms. The infamous Unhappily Ever After. Which is a bit like if Married with Children had been created by bitter, seething, alcoholic divorcees. From one of the creators of Married with Children. Marriage starts with them and ends with divorce. My ex-wife is going to make some man very happy. And she died. Funny you should say that, because that happens, or rather it doesn't, in one of the more nonchalantly mental moments in American television. By the third series in 1997, the husband and wife duo have effectively been usurped, as the show's focus, by Nikki Cox's breasts. <laughs> So they decided to kill off the wife character. But not to fire Stephanie Hodge, the actress playing her. Instead, they kept her on as a ghost. I'm kind of like a cross between Casper and Della Reese. <laughs> this probably gives you an accurate idea of how much of a shit anyone gave about this show by then. And indeed, you could probably come to some fairly apt conclusions about the WB itself and the whole idea. Failing that... Consider the very next episode, where they thought better of it, having received a pile of hate mail, and after trying to have her exercised by Father Guido Sarducci, in case anyone wanted to watch that, brought her back to life by the method of having an actual network executive wander on set and flatly announce that the whole thing was stupid. Look, kids, <laughs> it's Jordan Levin, high-powered executive from the mighty WB. <laughs> that definitely should give you some clues about the direction both the show and network were going after a mere two years. Well, I mean, I guess you guys know best, so... That's why we're number five, Kevin. Unsurprisingly, Stephanie Hodge pieced out of her own volition before the final season. Oh, also, there was a stuffed rabbit with the voice of Bob Goldthwaite that only Homer could hear. So that's the WB. At least that's how it started. And, yeah, it's a little rough. But very few new TV stations or networks didn't get off to a rough start. As for example, the WB eventually managed to find its niche in teenage pitch soap and or fantasy, a market they've continued to make their own as the CW, even if it seems increasingly because no one else wants it. I have to say, I like the aesthetic they went with at launch, setting everything on the iconic WB lot studded with neon show logos and Michigan hopping about with a line for everyone. Probably unsustainable over more than a month or so, but it's a neat and original identity for your network to have. As for Jamie Kellner, he moved on to take Daddy Turner's place at the head of TBS after six years, 
having launched the network and seen it through to relative stability, or the closest it ever got. He was only studio head a couple of years, but that was long enough to become known as the man who killed WCW, although I mostly blame Vince McMahon myself. Kellner just shut off the life support. Not really my wheelhouse, though. Everybody do the Michigan rag. Everybody likes the Michigan rag. Every May and Jane and Ruth, from Weehawken to Duluth, slide right, slide the Michigan stomp, rump, pump the Michigan jump, pump, pump the Michigan rag. That love in rag. You just sat through a Bob the Fish production. Nice! If you haven't already, you absolutely must check out bobthefish.org.uk. Literally hundreds more videos, not unlike that one, adding up to days worth of entertainment and all absolutely free. But if you're not a cold-hearted skinflint, you can always support us on Patreon. For as little as anything at all, you can make programs like the one you just watched possible in the first place, and become eligible for bonus material, such as glimpses of the book I'm writing about the BBC, monthly riffings on random commercial breaks, the complete archives of the angry political satire magazine Two Sons, and even the odd very occasional bonus video essay unavailable anywhere else. If nothing else, you should prevent me from starving and or freezing to death in the foreseeable future, so that'd be nice. No pressure or anything. BobTheFish.org.uk You make it what it is. Mm -hmm.